Josh McKinney. How are you doing? Excellent, sir. All right, man. I'm so glad you're here. Let me take a sip of water. All right, man. So, last time I saw you, you were kicking my ass on the on the mat pretty recently. <laughs> Holy shit, man. But always a good time. So, how's life treating you, man? You just started a podcast how long ago? Man, I'm almost I'm almost at two years now. Damn. Yeah. Dude. I say just. I know, right? Holy cow, time is flying. Yeah, two I didn't, years ago. I didn't start it much long uh much after being on your podcast. Yeah, you're one of my early guests. Mm -hmm. Probably like within the first fifty, I think. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. And yeah, that was uh just decided to start. It's called the I Suck at Jiu Jitsu show. Yeah. And uh you know, honestly doing our conversation and having fun with it was a big inspiration of like, man, I, I want to start a podcast, too. This was fun. Yeah. And, uh, man, that made such a difference for me was going in and just saying, I'm, I'm going to start. I don't know what it's going to be about. Right. I know it's going to be about jujitsu. First episode is just me talking into my phone for, like, 30 minutes. Yeah. And I got a lot of feedback on it. Everybody was, loved it. Yeah. I was like, oh, I could I could do this. And so then eventually started bringing on guests. And uh, I kind of do 50-50 between, um, like, having a guest on or just a, a solo cast episode yeah and uh, i really really uh enjoy doing it. it's a lot of fun which one do you like better you like sitting down with guests or do you prefer the solo cast it depends on the guest okay uh there are some times when i'm talking to somebody and i'm like man i'd rather be talking to myself right now <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like you are talking to yourself anyway <laughs> there are some that uh that i do that i get so much out of on the podcast mm -hmm. and i'm like this was this is why I enjoy having a podcast. Oh, yeah. And so it just depends on, on who the person is. But I always know, like, it's it's very enjoyable for me to sit down for an hour and have a, a, a topic that I'm going to discuss and just go in and, and start talking about it. Yeah. You start to learn uh, more about how you think a lot of the time, right? You're Because you're rambling. Right. You know, it's not like I'm word for word reading off something. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to talk about this. And I start rambling. Like, oh, that that's what my opinion is on yeah. it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes... You, like you have an idea of what you like what you think about something but you never really articulate it it's so weird how we can have like these thoughts and we know what like we understand what we feel about it or think about it but when you start putting it into words it's a little bit different it really is and you and I I want to say it was actually the last time that I was on your podcast it might have been when you were on mine we were talking about the benefit of teaching jujitsu to people yeah and the benefit of teaching your thoughts and ideas of things to people is so big because then you have to actually go, oh, no, I have a definite opinion on this. This is how I believe uh, this works. You know, this is how, for me, this is how I believe you're going to get better at jujitsu, right? Yeah. I think it also shines light on on maybe some of the areas that you're not maybe as sure in. like you, Because I think we all have the – uh, the tendency is just like human nature to to overestimate certain things <laughs> and just to be like yeah i totally have an understanding of that and really you have like an okay understanding but you don't have a full in-depth understanding but then when you have to put it in words you're like wait a second <laughs> like i thought i knew this thing or or maybe you're just a lot of times i'll get away with things just because i can be athletic uh -huh. and i just naturally just physically do it but i don't really think about it or mm -hmm. maybe have a a, a real understanding or conscious understanding of it so whenever i have to slow it down and teach it that changes everything it really does that is uh you know and, and i at least for some people some people revert back to well this is how i was taught this mm -hmm. so that's the way to learn it but you know maybe it's not because maybe it took you 10 years to actually get good at it yeah and it should have only taken you a few months right right uh and so you have to constantly as a coach you have to constantly be asking is this the most efficient way is this the most efficient use of their time and mine yeah the way i'm showing this and i think it really can help you uh, a, a lot in jujitsu to have to be put in that position where you have to teach yeah that's probably lazy coaching right i think so i it really is. <laughs> it <laughs> like, is. what else are you going to call it? And I think that, you know, I don't think that people maliciously are lazy mm -hmm. when they coach. Mm -hmm. I just think that uh, because they never looked at it from a, a, a an outside perspective, if you will. Yeah. Uh, it, they've never looked at it like that. They never have to think about maybe there is a better way. Yeah. You know, because it's just like, it's just like with anything. It's like you had uh, an abusive dad and then you go, oh, well, I 
I turned out right. So that logically right. means I need to abuse my son. And it's like, no, it, it doesn't mean that. You can now share with your son your viewpoint, where you're at now, and explain it to him. And so often in jujitsu, uh, probably in a lot of things, but especially in jujitsu, we say, this is how I was taught when I first started. So this is how it has to be for you. But I understand jujitsu completely different now. That was 14 years ago. Yeah. You know, the, the art was different then. Right. Now I have a much deeper understanding. I would much rather show you that understanding that I have now yeah. than, hey, this is this is what I learned 14 years ago. It created all these hurdles that I had to jump through. Right. Like, no, I want to help you skip those hurdles and make it easy for you to just understand. Right. Yeah, because the sports evolved, right? Oh, yeah. We're. I think we're – we're in this shift with the sport as like a martial art because when you look at martial arts traditionally, there's not a, I mean, they're not really known for a lot of like advancement and changing. Like there's a certain mindset that comes with traditional martial arts and it's really rooted in like, of just doing things the same for a very long time. And maybe not even like questioning who's, who your, who your teacher is or just, you know, it's just this complete buy-in mm -hmm. without necessarily like questioning. And maybe that comes along. I think that is what probably like drives like that style of teaching. It's like, all right, well, that's just what I was taught. This is how it's supposed to be. And and people will fall into a trap to where they'll teach it that way, even though they don't necessarily do it that way, mm -hmm. because they'll go through the years and they'll they'll tweak things. And then now, and then I think that's kind of where it gets into like the laziness of where you're not really taking audit of what you really do. You're just you're just teaching what was taught to you as opposed to being like, all right, well, this was taught to me, but I do this, this, and this different because I found this works better, so I'm going to teach it this way. I think you're seeing that more now just with – there's been a shift, I think, with the sport. I think you're seeing just a, a whole different mindset, just a whole new generation of guys who just want to – to, to advance the sport and, and do like creative and, and just new things. And they're just trying to teach whatever they can. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, I think that also brings up another important thing when it comes to teaching and learning is teachers have to be constantly learning. Yeah. Things are evolving. Things are changing. Uh, what I taught when I started my school as a purple belt, maybe the ideas were kind of the same, right? Maybe yeah. uh, I was approaching it the same way, but I'm so much better now uh, because I've been focused on learning. Yeah. Uh, if I had stayed in that purple belt mindset that I was in, and a lot of people do this once they open a school, they stop training with their guys, they stop finding other people to train with that challenge them, Yeah. so they stop progressing. Right. Eventually, I'm going to have taught you everything I know. Oh, yeah. Eventually, I'm going. To, you're going to be like, man, this dude... Everything, he, he always shows me the same crap all the time, right? right? It's always the same thoughts over and over. I need to be evolving my game as a teacher. Yeah. And I think that that's super important. It's just like a, a river that isn't being fed. Eventually, it's going to run out, right? Yeah. And we have to think about that uh, as coaches. You always you want a coach that is trying to learn and trying to have a better understanding. And then, of course, trying to share that with you, you know, right. trying to help you get that. And I think that... Maybe in jujitsu, it's just it, it is probably from the martial arts standpoint. You know, we treat sports in America very seriously, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's always about like winning. We're trying to figure out the better way to win. Martial arts, they really don't have that same mindset. They're mm -hmm. about self improvement. They're just about you. The problem there is if I do things just because of tradition, not because they're logical, not because they're better, someone else somewhere else is going to say, hey, there might be a better way to do this. And then the problem arises where now I've been left behind and all I'm holding on to is tradition. Yeah. I'm no longer holding on to actually learning, you know, actually evolving in uh, maybe even putting my own stamp on these things, you know. I'm just focused on, well, this is the way. We have to keep doing it. Yeah, you know? this is the way. This is the way, right? <laughs> Just listen to what I say. Uh-huh. Yeah, man, that'll get you left behind real quick. We're, we're definitely seeing, like, a huge, I think, just evolution with the sport. Man, and, and especially in Nogi, do you keep up with it? Oh, yeah. Dude, I, I'm such a fanboy. I am, too. <laughs> dude, I'm watch, are you going to watch Grapple Fest this weekend? I am going to watch Grapple Fest this weekend. <laughs> dude, this thing is so stacked, bro. I didn't, honestly, I literally just found out about it this morning, though. I oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know it. Uh, Heath Pedigo had posted uh, that he was going to England to uh, coach. Yeah. And I started looking at the card. 
And I was like, oh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna watch this, <laughs> dude. Yeah, I um, so George, who who trains under Heath, like he's in it, and I saw Dante Leone is also um gonna be on it. So I think they maybe just have super fights, but I think there's also a tournament. Uh huh. So I was, yeah, I was looking who was in that, and I was like, holy shit, dude, it's it's definitely. A who's who? You keep seeing the same names just oh, yeah. just popping up everywhere, dude. And it's it's real exciting to see these kids. They're all like eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old, like twenty year old kids. It's crazy. One time, I have a funny Dante Leon story. One time, uh, I fought him, and it's the only time we fought. And uh, I think we were brown belts, and he beat me with a calf slicer, oh, really? and it was brutal. It was super super tight. It was brutal. He actually got to this position where he was like belly down on the calf slicer, oh, and I was laying on my hands and I couldn't tap, and I'd like verbally tap. Oh, well, like two years later, uh, Josh Hinger. Do you know who Josh Hinger is? I don't know if I do. He's one of the uh, Otto's guys. He's a little older now, um, but he did a seminar at my coach Kyle's. Okay, and he we're talking about you know whatever and. We were talking about his division for a tournament, and he's like, "Yeah, I have that. you know, Dante Leon. He just got his black belt or whatever. He's super tough." He goes, "You know, I I, I saw him in, at Chicago Open. He almost broke this guy's leg with a calf slicer two years ago. It was crazy. <laughs> I can't believe it. Dude's leg didn't break." <laughs> and I'm like sitting there with my head down, and Kyle goes, "Yeah, that was Josh. Ah, <laughs> got him, got him, man. How does that feel? Be infamous a little bit, you know." Uh, I most of the jujitsu competitive fame that I've ran into has been infamy. So, oh my goodness. you know, I think you just uh, you just roll with it. You just take it where you can get it, right? You do. You just oh roll my. with it and you keep podcasting, dude. Yeah, and honestly, no one really pays attention anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'll, dude, I I kind of I don't. It's not maybe as bad as that, but like I mean. Infamous. I don't know if it's infamous or not, but I went against Will Tackett. Uh -huh. Did we I talk knew about that, this? That, no, yeah. I just I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was what you were gonna bring up, bro. Yeah, he's 16 years old. Handed it to me, bro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's so good. He is so good. Such a nice kid. He's so nice. He's almost nicer than you. You're like one of the nicest people I've ever met. <laughs> I've <laughs> never he's met him. Really nice. I'll have to challenge him to a niceness contest. I think. Yeah, yeah. You guys are going for it. We'll just like be shaking people's hand, making eye contact, patting them on the back. Yeah. We'll have a, it'll be a it'll be a niceness to Kathleen. Yeah. Although he doesn't rock the fanny pack, so oh. <laughs> we got to get this kid on the level. Bro. Seriously. Get this kid on the level. Dude. <laughs> did you watch the ADCC trials? I did. Dude, those my matches were crazy there were a lot of crazy one of my students competed on it she uh, uh competed in the heavier women's uh, division and just everybody i was looking through a division i'm like man there are ufc fighters there are super good black belts there are like world champions at every belt just yeah. you know just in your division and i mean then there are people that are brand new in your division because anybody can enter that. Anybody, yeah. And so, yeah, that was that's just that was the most stacked any tournament has been. Dude, yeah, it's, it's I was I was really happy that it wasn't like a ton of mats. I think it was like five mats on the first day and then three on the second, mm -hmm. so it was easy to keep up with. But man, yeah, there were I don't I don't know how, like seven hundred, eight hundred competitors or something in that thing. That's insane. Something and, crazy. And what? How many divisions are there? Like seven. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. That's insane to think about. Yeah, I'm probably off on that number. I'm sure it was more. I it feel was, like it was more. It was a lot. It was crazy. And then that was just the East Coast trials, right? They still have to do the West Coast trials. Mm -hmm. Usually, I'm pretty sure usually the West Coast is bigger. I don't know if this year, just because of like restrictions and stuff, the West Coast may be smaller. Yeah. Um, but I feel like usually the West Coast is the bigger. They usually do some uh, super fights on the West Coast trial and stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's usually huge. So yeah. I'm curious to see how ridiculous the west coast is after the east coast being that big oh dude yeah and especially you're gonna get a lot of people coming back wanting to to kind of get revenge or, oh yeah or, you know to prove themselves so you're, you're gonna have all those people who already qualified not be there so you kind of take that element out which is going to be interesting but you might have some people show up that weren't at the east coast trials mm -hmm. right just because maybe they didn't want to travel or who knows what the reason might be mm -hmm. yeah that's going to be interesting it really it really will be fun I, I can't wait to watch that do you ever think about like entering into that or you just prefer gi i don't really have a preference as much as uh i started to see the writing on the wall like two years ago where i feel like the jumping back and forth for the big competitions it started to, I think. It, I think it's just much harder, right? Uh, I, I look at jujitsu like there are a few handicaps that I start with, right? The first one is that I'm a school owner. It's harder to train full time when you, like dur during your mm -hmm. training time, you're taking care of students, right? right? The second big handicap is 
steroids are pretty widely accepted in jiu-jitsu. Bro, right? they're everywhere, especially they're... when you start hitting the master's division. Mm-hmm. Forget about it. They're almost there all in steroids. Everybody's on, right? Yeah. And, uh, and people think that that is like, a, oh, no, you're whining. You're, you're, you're not being on. No, I, I promise you, at adult black belt, 90% or more of the guys are on steroids and especially a lot of ones that are on Instagram saying like, Oh yeah, I don't, you know, I don't do steroids. You know, anyone who does a cheater and I'll talk to a friend that trained with him. Like, Oh yeah, that dude's on Uh everybody at the gym's on. Dude. So many people are just yoked. They're just so jacked. Yeah. And it's like, uh, so for me, I really think, I think that there are guys that are natural and nogi, but I really think that, uh, the physicality that you can gain with, having an extra 15, 20 pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it's really hard to overcome. I think it's harder to overcome in Nogi than it is the Gi. Uh, And then also the jump back and forth. You see what what happened with like the Danaher death squad was they were like, no, we're only focused on Nogi. Well, everyone was still cool with doing eight months of the year of Gi and then four months of Nogi. Right. And it, it showed, it showed like, oh yeah, we're, we train this more than everybody else, right? right? And so um, as they started to split, I said, okay, I'm going to take one for a while. Uh, I actually do have, because I enjoy leg locks a little more, I, I actually enjoy no gi a little more. Yeah. But I've dedicated so much time to being focused on the gi. And, like, I haven't gotten to do worlds as a, as a black belt. You know, they didn't have it last year. Mm-hmm. The year that I got my black belt, uh, uh, I didn't I, – I missed, like, qualifying by, like, two points or something oh. like that and so uh it, it, it's just i've never gotten to do an adult yeah. world and so i'm not gonna kind of move my focus till no to nogi until at least i do that yeah you know? until and even maybe get a few opportunities at it yeah that makes sense yeah yeah i mean if if somebody's putting 100 percent of their time into something and you're not it's gonna be very tough to be successful mm-hmm. which is what you're seeing at nogi you're seeing people fully dedicated to nogi yeah, and there there are some people that can do both. They, mm-hmm. they, there are very few and far in between, but some people can just be great at both. Uh, I think with uh, the the time that I have, I think that I probably can't do both. I think I could be very, very good at one. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that there will be a, probably a time in a few years where I get – I'm kind of like more to the end of competing in the gi. Yeah. And I might want to uh, pursue no gi a little more. Switch over to that one. Mm-hmm. Man. Yeah, no gi is really fun. It um I, th- I feel like it's easier than gi. Like no gi's easier than gi. And and, and and just maybe in just certain regards, but just because the grips are different, so it's not maybe as physically exhausting. It's essentially just like a lot of wrestling. It's just it's in my mind it really is just submission grappling. It's not the same as jujitsu. <laughs> I, I agree with I think that uh the biggest difference is you know in jujitsu all we're trying to do is control our opponent right we're just trying to figure out or in grappling in general not just jujitsu uh we're just trying to gain more control so we can you know in jujitsu finish them in wrestling pin them in judo throw them right we're just trying to gain more control it's there are way more expressions of control in the gi for example to mm. control the back of your head in no gi i have to collar tie you right mm-hmm. there's really not a lot of other options to control the back of your head i I mean a collar tie an underhook with a hug on your head something like that yeah in the gi i could cross collar grip you i could same side collar grip you i could you know there's so many grips i could grab low on the lapel i can grab high on the lapel it's still expressing control but there are just so many other ways to express control which makes it like I, i don't ever like to say that it is more complex but there are a lot more options so it does make it more complex, I guess. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I, I do agree that, like, when it comes to understanding, I would almost argue that it, it might be better for a lot of people to try to understand Nogi first because it is a little easier to understand what is happening mm. and then start to transition to the Gi. And that used to not be how my, my thought process. I used to have a different thought process of, like, no, start with the Gi and then transition to Nogi. Uh, I think it really depends on the person. Hmm. I feel, feel like if a young athlete comes in and they are trying to get good at jujitsu, I would probably have them start nogi now and say like, hey, this is where you should probably put more of your focus in. Uh, one, because there's more money in it now. Uh, yeah, there's, from a financial standpoint. Yeah, there's definitely going to be – there's definitely now more money in nogi than there is in the gi. You see mm-hmm. all of the – like these super fight shows and stuff that they had go on uh, during like kind of like the height of the pandemic – 
they were all nogi. Mm-hmm. Every everything was nogi. Yeah, everything. And uh, you know, it just gets more viewers, and so financially, it makes more sense. But honestly, from a point of understanding, like having a deep understanding of jujitsu, I feel like it's just harder to attain in the gi at first. I think you can have a deep understanding of both. They relate to each other a lot, but I do feel like because there's just less options in nogi, mm-hmm. it's sometimes for a lot of people, it makes more sense. It can make it easier for them. Yeah, that makes sense. There's also lower bar- like barrier to entry into nogi, right? Like mm-hmm. You don't have to buy a gi. You don't. I mean, shorts and a t-shirt for a lot of people if you're just starting out. And then once you start buying rash guards, I mean, those aren't crazy expensive. There's, I mean, they can get up there, but there's still a whole lot you know, less than a gi. That is very true. Unless you get like a Sanibel like training gi or something for like six. I yeah, mean, those you, are nice. You can get pretty cheap gis actually. You can. Now I think about it, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, if you don't have anything though, just shorts and a t-shirt will get you started, mm-hmm. right? So there is that. I've always thought about it the other way, but now that you're explaining it, it kind of makes sense. I've always just thought that it's easier. I think when you're starting, yeah, it probably is easier to pick up no gi, right? Oh, because, I mean, there is a lot to gi. But I've always just thought, hey, it's easier to, to go from gi to no gi because you're just taking away things, like all the different grips mm-hmm. and control, as opposed to trying to add them in. It can be very hard to make that transition. So you'll, what you'll find is I think a lot of people, will they'll, they'll start with no gi, and then they won't ever switch over to gi just because they get frustrated, and they're like, oh, this is hard, but I'm still doing jujitsu over here, so why would I do this other thing over here? That's stupid. Yeah. Instead of just being like, oh, this is hard. How can I get better at it? They'll be like, oh, gi's dumb. I'm just going to do no gi. And I, yeah, I think under, like, I think some people just enjoy it more. Some people, yeah. like, I, it, it does make more sense to a lot of people to start with no gi because, like, there are times in my life that I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Oh, yeah. I'm never wearing thick cotton pants and a, a bathrobe, you know? Like, yeah. So just that, like, yeah, this relates to my everyday life a little more. Uh, I think that that is important. But uh, I was hanging out with my friend Chris Paynes. He was in town, and he had a really – we were just talking about gi and no gi. And he goes, yeah, you know, uh, he's like, I, I, I do a lot of no gi. And he's like, but I love training in the gi. And he goes, and people will – that do the same amount of nogi as me will be like, oh yeah, I, you know, I hate the gi, the gi's stupid or whatever. And he goes, oh really? That's how to beat you is to put more clothes on you. That's interesting. He's like, that is the one thing that stops your jujitsu from working is putting a putting a jacket on you. And he's like, and you can't do jujitsu anymore. And he's like, you should be able to understand jujitsu yeah. in both, you know, in both aspects, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that. You know, it's just different ways of of kind of expressing the same thing. Right, right. But here, I mean, there is the benefit. I mean, we are all usually wearing a shirt, mm-hmm. and and no gi, you don't really get a chance to to use that. Yeah. But I mean, I, if I can grab your gi, I mean, I can easily translate that to a t shirt or mm-hmm. something, and still choke you with it. Yeah. So you do lose that. I I agree. Yeah. I I <laughs> think that. Uh, there's no right answer here. I, yeah, I don't think that there is when it comes to it. I really think it depends on the individual. Yeah, 100%, man. Just if if you enjoy trying something out and you want to get into it, do whatever you want to do. I love them both. I really love working legs. I think we were talking about it at the gym once. Um, not enough people train legs, especially here in the Midwest. I agree. It's freaking crazy. Like, I need to get better. I um I felt at, at Master Worlds that I just competed, I felt like I did a pretty good job incorporating the legs quite a bit. I got to get better at really locking down that control position so I can finish the submission. But, man, they are so great just to create scrambles. Like, you can wrestle up. You can sweep. Oh, my God. You can almost sweep everybody. If like, you get underneath them? Yeah, and then kind mm-hmm. of, like, bringing that over to, like, a 50-50 or something. And, like, you can just come right up. And there you go. You got an easy sweep. I don't know why more people – don't, everyone's just so afraid of their knees for it's, some reason. I think it just comes from that idea that, like, you know, I think you, it, it was sold to me when I started, like, yeah, if you get put in a heel hook, your ACL is going to tear and you're going to be, yeah. You know, like, yeah, well, if I don't tap to a heel hook, right. my ACL could tear and I could be in a really bad situation. But if I don't tap to an arm bar, I could get my arm broken. Yeah. And it, I could still be in a really bad situation. And more people are likely to not tap to that. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so I think it's just, uh, you know, I think it's just the understanding of it. I, I remember the first time that I really started to work leg locks. We were I, I wasn't like I was I think I was a brown belt when I really started to like focus on them and say, Okay, there's something to this. I've got to get better at this. And it was because of when I was a brown belt, I was losing matches to leg locks. Mm. And I'm like, man, I like that was actually as a brown belt, I think like out of every match that I lost, all but like one 
was to leg locks. We're talking about gi or no gi right now? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah, just, just, just competing in general. in jiu-jitsu. I was just losing to a lot of lower body attacks. And so I didn't uh, – so like basically like how I try to learn anything is get a bunch of opinions and a bunch of um, – uh, thoughts from people and then I start to look and say okay what what do I believe what can I you know what can I test and, and see that is true and then what can I throw away yeah and um, one of the simplest things that I learned was uh, from Tom de Blas he said hey you should drill the finish of heel hooks for the person being heel hooked and uh, so what he did was like had you sit in the position and then uh, like me and my dad were drilling this and so he would put me in an outside heel hook and I would tap, he would go really slow and it was super controlled. And then I would tap when I felt it. Mm -hmm. And so we just did that to kind of start to get aware of like, oh, when my leg is trapped, I'm not actually in danger. Right. It's when he starts to get this grip. That's when I'm actually in danger. Right. That's when I tap. The problem is most people look at lower body attacks is all one thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, as soon as he starts to get my lower body, I just tap. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that because you want to know where they're actually – the guy might have no idea what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you want to start to learn first, like, where am I not safe? You know, okay, when he extends my leg like this, I am not safe. Right. Uh, and then when you're live rolling, then you're actually able to experiment during the round and say, oh, right there, I'm not safe. I need to tap. You know, right. I have that rule. I know once I get put there, I need to tap. But before that, I can be fighting. I can be learning how to defend the legs. And most people just don't look at that because – when people start to realize that they have that problem of like, wow, I'm not good at leg locks, at least in the Midwest. This is just what I've noticed. Right. They're usually a little bit higher of a belt. They're a purple belt. Well, if you're a purple belt and you're going with white belts and they're leg locking you, you're going to be like, oh, man, this, you know, this sucks. I, you know, I, I, I get, leg locks are stupid. I shouldn't, you know, I need to not train with these people or whatever, right? Um, or I just need to do everything to just avoid those positions. Right. Instead of going in and saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get better at leg locks to get better. I'm going to have to get submitted by leg locks by people that I am substantially better than in every other aspect of jujitsu. Yeah. These guys are going to have to submit me. How I started getting good at leg locks was some of my guys that I want to say they might've been blue belts at the time, but they could have even been white belts started watching a lot of instructionals on attacking the legs. We would just start in those positions. We'd yeah. say, okay, we're going to start with outside Ashi. Go ahead. And they, if they submitted me, okay, restart. Do it again. Why did that work? Well, let's figure it out. And so just taking that idea out that, like, it's about winning and losing in the gym. Yeah. I think that is one of the biggest reasons that people, at least in our area, are still – underutilizing under not understanding how to attack and defend the legs as much as they should yeah yeah it, people you'll, you'll they'll just panic tap right mm -hmm. the, you'll start touching an area and they're just i don't feel comfortable on you want to do it man and it's like <laughs> man you're way away from danger you're not in any danger right now mm -hmm. you know what i mean and people will they'll avoid it early on or they won't get taught early on just for whatever reason to avoid injury for some reason and then you start building up this story that this is the most dangerous thing that you could be training. And then by the, like, to your point, you know, when you're an upper belt, then you just avoid it. Mm -hmm. And then if you start getting older, then you're just like, man, I don't want to blow out something. But the more I've trained legs, especially with uh, like people who are really good at it, I think the motion that people are always worried about, which is like, oh, I don't want to like twist something and t blow out my knee. Well, one, as long as you don't panic and, and roll out in a crazy way, which a lot of people will roll and, blow up their own knee like, even if you put them in like, a straight ankle lock somebody might try to roll just mm -hmm. not having an understanding and completely met i've had people roll out of stuff i'm like dude if i would have really locked this down on you you would have completely tore up your own knee like you got to just relax a little bit you know what i'm saying so i think there's that fear but then just having the understanding that when you are training these things like you don't always have to win right it's not about winning these things i think there's definitely that white belt mentality where they're a little, they're driven by ego a little bit more and they, they, it feels good to win and get that tap. And that's how you kind of measure your success in the gym. Oftentimes is, did I get that tap? And really, man, if you just slow down and at least focus on controlling the position, I'm just, I'm just trying to, whenever I entered into like training legs and now I kind of use this philosophy for any kind of position, I really do take the control 
piece first. It's like, mm -hmm. can I enter in this position controlled and get it to where I know I have the submission or I at least have time to try to work the submission? Because oftentimes you need to get into it and it's, you're going to kind of halfway be there and then you need to like start tightening it up and buttoning it up and you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. really closing those gaps. But you got you to gotta have that mindset. You really do. And, and when it comes to control, every part of jujitsu, every part of grappling, every part of any of the grappling arts, they have to do with control. Yeah. But for some reason, there's a disconnect with jujitsu that once you're going for the submission, it is now about the submission and it is not about control. Mm -hmm. It's all about control. The, you yeah. don't get the submission unless you control, right? It's like... I don't get to arm bar you from your closed guard, right? Because I don't have any control of your upper body. How am I going to arm bar you? Mm -hmm. But when I'm in mount, now I'm starting to gain more control of your upper body and I can arm bar from that position. Yeah. And uh, so since I worked that hard to get to the control, why am I giving it up? Like why in, in my leg locks, why am I not obsessively focused on the control? Why am I just focused on the squeeze, right? Right. It's like I only have a certain amount of squeeze that I have anyway. Yeah. And so why not focus more on being able to keep your person from moving, right? Yeah. That I have a few seconds even in a lot of these positions where I can go, oh, okay, he's still fighting really hard. I'm going to wait for him to stop, you know, and th yeah. then I'm going to go to finish it because I have the, I have the position control. And so I think that that is a, a big disconnect. But also, where we were relating earlier, like people thinking of jujitsu too much of a martial art and not as much of a game, you can almost argue that being the opposite for getting better. A lot of times people get so focused on winning mm -hmm. in jujitsu that it, it messes them up, right? It, it ends up, they, that's where I put my focus on. And uh, then what ends up happening is I don't win as much because that's where I'm focused. I'm not focused on what I should be, which is skill development, right? Yeah. Uh, the, de the, the development of the skill of learning leg locks. You don't go in and say, well, I'm a brown belt at everything else, so I should automatically be a brown belt at leg locks. Right. It's like if you said, hey, I'm not as good at this skill. I need to start from the beginning and figure out how to develop it. And I just think so few people in jujitsu actually do that. I think it's more, I don't know, it's just more about like, okay, I get, all I'm trying to do is get to a certain level. And then I'm like, okay, I'm cool with being at that level forever. I'm kind of a master of jujitsu now. Yeah. Uh, instead of going, okay, I'm, I'm at that level with these things. What am I not at that level with? You know, how could I get better? Or how can I go up even a level past that? How can I get yeah. better at that? And uh, yeah, just, it's probably... Not that, you know, probably I'm kind of talking like only about things that are bad in the jujitsu community, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess, I guess you could look at it from a different perspective of if that is you, if you're somebody who is struggling with like, man, I, I feel like there are these positions of jujitsu that are just black holes to me. I know nothing about like, okay, that's good because that means you can just focus on that position for like six months, a year, two years, and you can get so much better at developing that skill. But the first step is to get in that position and lose a bunch from it. Oh, yeah. You know, that's how you learn these positions. Tons you know? and tons of losing, dude. Yeah. And there are so many positions that I don't even know I don't know, to be honest with <laughs> uh -huh. you. Man. Like, you, you, you kind of get into these into these these training I don't know, ruts, but you just, you just kind of get in these uh, – and these habits, these routines, right? And you, you end up training the same things or maybe you train something and then you, you quit using it for however long or, or whatever the case may be. But I find like like my game is a certain way or whenever I go and visit like like the pedagog guys, I'll be working with Spatch. He does a, a ton of Barambolo. He's always inverting and stuff. And that's not really in my game, but he has this in-depth knowledge to that to that game. So I immediately feel like a white belt is the moment I start training with this guy. I'm like, holy cow, there's just all of... There's this whole position and there's just all this depth to it that is not where I feel comfortable. So I think sometimes it's easy for people to, to avoid those things because then you start doubting yourself as a whole. It's like if you start getting to black belt, it's like, man, I don't know anything about this. So how am I a black belt? Huh? <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, you can still be really good and, and still not know everything. Like that's totally okay. And that's, you know, and you're never going to know everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, I always tell my students, if you ask me a question now, and then you ask me the same question three years from now, my answer will probably be completely different, <laughs> right. but both will be right. Both will be, you know, it's like, uh, but we always, you know, like 
is just so common to deal in absolutes of like this is the only way to do it. Yeah. And it's it's usually not true. I avoid guys who tell me that kind of stuff. Right? <laughs> yeah. And it's it's like, yeah, dude, that's you know, maybe that's the the best way for you to do it. Yeah. You know, but you can't say that that's the you're five foot four and this dude's six foot seven. You can't tell me that it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna carry over. It's yeah. gonna be the same. Right. You know, uh you you've got there's so many different variables for there to be an absolute this is the best technique. This oh, is yeah. the best grip to have. Uh, it's just we should all be focused on trying to understand more yeah. and less about the actual every little detail right. of, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Because you you're never going to know all the details. Never. You know, and they change too. Mm -hmm. my, it, all the details that you know may change by me shifting my weight from one leg to the other. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, well, now everything's ruined. Yeah. And so you've got to – I think you've got to – be focused on understanding when it comes to jujitsu. Yeah, we're we're in a cool place where you can learn from anybody now with mm -hmm. with these instructionals, right? Which is actually a perfect segue into something that you're really working on, right? Like you're doing a lot more of like instructionals and, and helping people produce those and put those out, right? Yes, so we are. So we started uh, me and my dad and one of my brown belts, Logan. We started simplifying jujitsu. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, you know, it, it's a jujitsu production company. The idea was. One, there, there was nothing like this really in the Midwest where people could, uh, you know, share their jujitsu. Yeah. And so, you know, we've had like my coach, Kyle, we've had Nick Sanders, uh, who you've had on your podcast, correct? Yeah. I've had Kyle as well. Okay. So Kyle yeah. Watson for the people listening. Yeah. So you've had both guys on your podcast and, uh, you know, like, so they've both done instructionals with us. We have a few other ones that we're working on right now, but, uh, yeah, it was just something, it was something different. Like, I feel like there are some of these companies now that focus so much on volume because it makes a lot of money, right? Yeah. Um, hey, this guy won a world championship. You should buy his DVD. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that guy sucks as a teacher, right? Maybe, yeah. You know, and uh, it can almost cause a problem. You know, it's like now that we're in the information age, the problem for us is what information is actually right, what yeah. information is actually useful. And, uh, and then obviously like applying that information too. But so often, just like we were talking about earlier, guys – will they'll have a specific game they play and then they'll go to teach you it and you'll be like this isn't what this guy does this mm. guy doesn't even know what he does you know it's just like it comes natural you know they learn jujitsu through osmosis they learn by feel yeah and it's very hard you know it's just like when you're you're talking to your girlfriend or your wife it's hard to communicate feelings yeah. feel the way you feel is very hard and so when we're doing jujitsu and it's all done by feel it is very, very hard to communicate what is actually happening right. in a way that is useful to you, that's understanding to, or understandable to you. And so that was kind of our big thing with starting Simplifying Jiu-Jitsu was, okay, whatever we put on here, it's just got to be good. Yeah. Like that's the – that's <laughs> it's got to be understandable. Mm -hmm. It can't just be, hey, you're buying this because this guy is relevant. Yeah. Uh, you're buying this because it will actually make you better at what – we're claiming it will make you better. Yeah. Than, you know? So you're trying to build a credible source. It's like, hey, it doesn't matter necessarily. Obviously, you want, like, credible people teaching. But it's it's not like, hey, we're trying to play a numbers game to where we're going to put everybody out. And it's up to you to figure out who you want to learn from. And and where it's like, well, we know some of these are going to suck, but we're just going to just play the numbers game. We're like, all right, maybe that doesn't sell, but we're going to sell X amount of units of this one, so it's all going to offset. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And al almost kind of essentially – like watering down, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, the source. So it sounds like you're trying to create, like, say, all right, you know when you come to simplifying jiu-jitsu, no matter who you're learning from, we're going to put out quality stuff because we're really, like, you are like you have a whole gatekeeper process. You're not just going to put everybody, mm -hmm. you know, out there. Yeah, and you have people that, like, you know, for me, that's the biggest, uh, like, uh, like, good thing that's happened for my podcast is – the amount of new people that I've gotten to talk to and understand what, you know, their view of jujitsu. Yeah. And, uh, the, the problem with that is then you start to realize, man, a lot of these people that I know, a lot of these people I talk to, they don't, they don't really understand it very deeply. Mm. You know, they don't really. And so that's why, like, we're picky about who we have showing on yeah. the, you know, on the stuff, but then it creates a problem of, well, shoot, who are we going to film with? Oh, you know? yeah, and that's a, that's a double-edged sword. It is, and so, uh, but it's been really fun, and we are still honestly so new to yeah. the space, and so, you know, I, I honestly, I, I, like I think about it when it comes to doing, running the business as a whole, we are still, you know, 
infant at understanding it, you yeah. know. Uh, but I really think the idea is really growable, and it's something that will continue to build on itself, and uh, you know, and, and continue to grow. And and you know, for me, I really hope that it is able to be one of those things that one day I have students that are coming up that have come up with me and they're filming on it, you know, and it's, it's an avenue to kind of get them out there and it's an avenue to make them money doing jujitsu. And then of course it's an avenue to grow simplifying jujitsu. Right. And so that's kind of like what the long term dream is of it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use that? Do you simplify jujitsu as like a sponsor for I suck at jujitsu? I do not. I don't. Oh, you totally should. Uh, it doesn't. It, I suck at jujitsu does better than simplifying jujitsu. No, no, don't so change. Far. Don't don't change the name. But like, um, like whenever you're on there, like do you promo. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, definitely. Yeah, like a show sponsor. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like sponsor yourself. It's like, oh yeah, this is also brought to you by simplifying jujitsu. Like check. I'm. Uh huh. That's. <laughs> I'm telling you how to do your own show, Josh. That's dude. That's what I do. Though. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just anytime we're running a deal or anytime we have something yeah, new. It's all. It's all for your own shit. Our last big one that we did was with my dad. It was on his 60th birthday. <laughs> and uh, cause you know, my dad, he like has a unique story. He didn't get his black belt until he was like 57, mm-hmm. I think 50, 57 or 58. And, uh, that's really unique in jujitsu. Most oh, yeah. people, if you get a black belt, it's like in the forties, it may be you're, you're old if you get your black belt at 50. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it is, uh, uh, you know, it's unique that this guy had to come up while being old the whole time you know Mm -hmm. like there was never a point where he goes oh yeah you know like i remember when i used to train and i felt great the next day it's like yeah i've never felt great the next day after training (laughs) it just always hurts yeah it's just always been tough and so uh we were able to do something like doing more niche stuff of like uh we we did train until 60 and beyond and so we released it on his birthday and it was really fun because there's so many guys that are 40 plus that start jiu-jitsu and they're like hey my 30 year old instructor, he, I, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get w- what I'm dealing with. Yeah. And uh, so we were able to have a guy that really does get it that, you know, started while his his coach was fighting. Kyle was fighting in the UFC, you know, wow. and he's starting with his son who's trying to compete. And so how do you where do you fit in that? Right. And uh, he did such a good job explaining that, you know, how to how to fit in that and where you fit in that. And so yeah. it's been really that that uh, out of all the ones that we've done. That I think is my favorite, just because it's like, uh, one, it's my dad, and right. you know, and two, it's just, it's so niche. It is so unique to like, hey, there's a group of you that are kind of forgotten, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, even a lot of the stuff that is sold to you as, oh, jujitsu for forty year olds plus, it's like, dude, no, no, it's not. You know, you right. guys are barren bowling. They're not. You're not doing that at sixty. Yeah, and uh, so it is. It was cool that we were able to to do that. And, yeah, uh, yeah, it's been good. Yeah, he has a unique perspective, and I, I have to imagine that you know that particular journey of of starting it later in life has got to be more and more relevant as the sport is growing. I mean, I I, I got to imagine you're seeing more guys that are like, man, I want to try something new or get in shape or you know maybe find some new friends and they're they're gravitating towards jujitsu in maybe like their late 30s or early 40s and so you do kind of have maybe a little bit of an older crowd Mm -hmm. you know finding their way into jujitsu so it's probably becoming more of a relevant perspective to have it really is it's yeah it's no longer considered crazy to be 45 and come into a gym you know yeah and so it's it's like oh no we have guys that are your age that train you know it's different it's not the same, you know, you, you yeah. have a little less space to just destroy your body, mm-hmm. but, uh, it's still not crazy anymore. You can come in and do this and get the benefits right. from it. I think a lot of people have the, uh, the idea that it's, it's very much a young man's sport mm-hmm. and it's like, no man, there's, there's a speed for everybody mm-hmm. with this thing. You know what I'm saying? Like you probably get, at least I noticed whenever I was helping with kids class quite a bit, you get a lot of dads who kind of peak interest if if they see uh-huh. their kid doing it. It's like, hey, man, you can also come do this. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Well, it, I mean, you're going to be learning jujitsu just like the kids, but you know what I'm saying? It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be the same pace. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. totally make it work. That's, yeah, that's, it, it's, yeah, it's so good that it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Dude, you're building a whole jujitsu empire right now. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. You know, I always... I honestly, I always thought after my gym started to get more successful, I thought that I would want, I, you know, I enjoyed doing business stuff and mm-hmm. I thought I would want to leave the jujitsu space, not, not my gym, keep my gym, mm-hmm. but like do business outside of my gym. Yeah, kind of shift your focus and a little bit. 
uh, honestly, the the more like the longer that it goes, the more I'm like, no, I really, I I feel like I still have so much to learn in jujitsu, yeah. and uh, tying my businesses into that mm-hmm. helped me so much, right? Like my podcast, I've learned so much. I've learned more from my podcast than probably anyone else has, even though half the episodes are me just talking to the listener. Yeah. Uh, it's because the guys that I've gotten to be in contact with, they know so much. I do. Yeah. You've had some amazing guests. Yeah. And so it really does, uh, you know, like that's kind of why I've stayed in the jujitsu space. And I always think like to the future, one day I'm going to have this podcast that is a very, very big in the jujitsu space. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have these competitors that are coming up that I can always bring on to my podcast if I ever need somebody or to help them grow their brand and, uh, you know, teaching my students how to brand and, and learning things like that. I just think it's a different perspective than most coaches give. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but most coaches like, Hey, you're here to learn jujitsu. I'll teach you jujitsu. And then you have to go and figure out all the business stuff on your own. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to go in and, and that's tough. Cause like all these kids, they then start from square one and it's really hard to Dude, learn it's, that it's stuff, tough, man. Right. And yeah. so, uh, you know, I just, I, the way the, the like deeper I get into it, uh, in, in my approach is how I, you know, I, when I eventually go to only coaching mm-hmm. and uh, I'm no longer a competitor, I'm just focused on coaching. I want there to be opportunity for the guys to not just be like, Hey, you know, maybe you'll win a world title. Maybe you won't. <laughs> maybe we'll, maybe um, we'll. And, and it be more like, Hey, regardless of if you're a, this phenomenal competitor, regardless of if you win everything, yeah. you're going to be able to, uh, make money doing what you've dedicated the last 10 years of your life to, right. you know, and I'll, I want to help you at least get the basis and the foundation of that. Yeah. Because it's still valuable. You know, mm-hmm. I think that, uh, and I'm, I'm very guilty of this kind of like the ideas creeped in my mind to where it's like, Oh man, if you're not one of these like top 10 guys or you're not like a world champion, then who's going to take you serious? You know what I'm saying? Like, why would anybody want to learn from you? Uh-huh. Or how are you going to actually create a career doing like in this space? If you're not one of those guys, mm-hmm. but you definitely can. I mean, there's a, there's, plenty of like those guys can't teach everybody and to your point some of those guys or a lot of those guys might not be even good at teaching so mm-hmm. why would you and and teaching isn't just the only way to to, to make money doing jujitsu some guys uh are great writers some guys are uh you know i have students that have uh went to school for like videography and mm-hmm. things like that yeah you can apply that to jujitsu and 100%. make money yeah. you know or build a brand and then make money and that's kind of what i've been uh, kind of trying to push my students towards a lot. It's like, hey, yeah, you should even when you're a white belt. Like, uh, I think that we're you, we would probably agree that at, at this era in time, your reputation is really important. For example, if I said uh, if I made a post on Facebook after this and I said, hey, just so you guys know. Adam Meredith is a racist. <laughs> you would go, you'd be like, wait, there's no, right. there, there's no, you know, how, I don't even know how to argue this. Well, this doesn't make sense, but it would still damage your reputation. People that know you would be like, no, he's not. That's not true. Yeah. But a lot of people would just associate the name and go, oh yeah, yeah. They are, you know, that this person is a racist. I better never buy a product from him. I better never listen to his podcast and nothing. Yeah. So that shows how important your reputation is. I think you should be building that as a jiu-jitsu competitor from white belt. What you're posting on social media is really important. If you, uh, you know, start to try to become an instructor and then we look back seven or eight years from now, the stuff that you were saying on Facebook, that could really damage your business, right? You could make the same argument the opposite. If what I was posting on Facebook was getting people to more, more people to watch me and more people to enjoy me and more people to follow my journey. Well, I've built a brand now. Yeah. And now I can, when I open a school, when I start a YouTube channel, when I start a jujitsu production company, whatever, I have a brand, right? I have people go, Oh, this person was, this person was, was really good when they were white, belt. they were really cool dude. They have a really unique story and you kind of tell people your story. And uh, I think that would be so helpful for so many young jujitsu athletes to know that you can start building your brand. That doesn't mean you have to be selling stuff. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to be doing instructionals online, but you could start building your brand from white belt and plant seeds that like, where a lot of people get their black belt and then go, well, now I need to figure out how to build a brand. I need to figure out how to make money right. doing this. 
you already will have been so far ahead of them. Yeah. Uh, you're not starting at white belt when you're, you know, at, at marketing when you're a black belt, which is where a lot of us start that opens jujitsu schools. Yeah. Uh, and so just learning to learning to do that, I think is important. Yeah, man. Just building that personal brand. Uh -huh. right? I mean, we all have one just whether, I mean, it's whether or not you just kind of want to acknowledge it and then cultivate it. Yeah. Yeah. You're like a business coach for all your guys, man. <laughs> uh, I think that's, yeah, I think it's important. I think it's just right. You, you always try to, uh, you know, my dad always, uh, when, when I was a kid, when he would give me a piece of floss, he would give me like a three foot piece of floss. And I never really questioned it until one day <laughs> I was like, dad, why do you give me so much floss? He says, well, when I was a kid, my mom used to give us the shortest piece of floss ever. And I always said, when I have kids, they're going to have as much floss as they want. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you think about it like that is when I was starting, um, when I was starting with my school, I was able to ask my coach a bunch of questions and he was super helpful. And then I was like, man, I wish I would have known to ask him those questions five years before, mm. you know, like, uh, that's the funny thing about knowledge is like, yeah, you, you get it when you can, yeah. but you're always like, man, I wish I knew that before. Right. And so that's what, uh, you, know, I just try to ask myself with my students, Hey, what did I wish that I had, you yeah. know, what did I wish that would have been awesome for me to have? And, uh, Really, just an understanding of marketing, yeah. just a basic understanding of marketing and branding, I think could change so many people's lives. Yeah. And uh, especially people that want to dedicate their life to such a niche sport yeah. like jujitsu. And so I think that uh, it, it's just, it's an important thing to focus on now. And, and people just don't focus on it. Yeah. We all have, like, so we all have a personal brand, especially on, on social media. And uh, yeah, you don't you don't want to like be behind the ball trying to like create that. It's definitely something we're always creating. Dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the curse. It's the curse of social media, right? It really is because everyone's just putting up their highlights, <laughs> and and uh, especially like in the entrepreneurial space, you'll start to like you know comparisons the thief of joy. You start to compare, and then and then uh, and maybe I'm just like talking about my own struggle, but it's like man, uh, then some people will like or at least I've been like discouraged to where, you know, I won't post things. And then like, and then you're just like not working on the thing. It's like, man, just put your head down and just like do the work and, mm -hmm. and just try to build something. And you'll find, I'm, I, I don't know if this is how it is for you, but for me and my podcast with anything that I do, yeah, consistency is the hardest thing. Yeah. That's the key though. It is, it is, but it's like, you know, cause you get tired of it. You're like, okay, I'm building this brand and I'm, you know, I'm doing the, I suck at jujitsu show. Yeah. And it's like, man, wonder if everyone's just tired of hearing about it. Yeah. You know, this podcast started after mine and they probably have more listeners than me. They're growing much faster. What am I doing wrong? And so you're just, it, it's this like, uh, when you're doing anything entrepreneurial, you are just in a fight with the little voice in your head yeah. all the time. All the right? time. And so, uh, and it's just about like every day going, okay, I'm going to win today. Yeah. I'm going to win today. Yeah. But like you said, a lot of it's just, so it's just marketing. You know what I mean? Just having that understanding of just like advertising. And then it, this was like a real big lesson to me. Like, all right, you need to like invest in like ad spend uh -huh. and then just trust that like the ROI is going to be there. Like <laughs> you really do. You've got to learn to do that. Uh, um, I see that you have one of Russell Brunson's books right there, but yeah. was, he has a, a quote where he says that uh, most problems in, in society could be solved with better marketing. Yeah. And, uh, and it really is true. If you could tell your story to people, some people have these amazing stories. Mm. If you could tell that to people, you could change people's lives. Yeah. And, uh, but it doesn't matter if you don't know how to market because no one's going to hear it. Right. And so you've got to learn to do that pretty much Man, now I think, I think that we're moving to an age. I don't think it's here yet, but I think we're moving to an age where like things like marketing are going to become even more important because things are moving less in person and more and more online. And so everybody's online all the time. Yeah, I know. and uh, being able to to kind of tell that story, I think, is going to be really important. Yeah, we're moving into a very interesting place. Like this whole like meta meta world. We really metaverse. are. Oh my goodness, what do you think about that? Man, I don't even. So I, I it just like I try to learn anything else. Uh, I just try to listen to as many different opinions and thoughts as I can. Yeah. And then kind of choose from there, test and choose, right? And let's say like this is what I think. But when it comes to it, I still don't even have the most basic understanding of the metaverse or of 
of any of it, to be yeah. honest. I don't know. We're we're definitely headed in, into weird times. I don't know. I don't know what to think about it just yet, dude. Uh, but it 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 it's so hard. Not I don't know if it's so hard, but it's just you know as we're talking about like you know building a personal brand and and like putting everything out there like online. It's like man, it's so loud. On like on social media, like getting through, like creating those connections, and I always have this resistance of like giving all my money to Facebook. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't want to give you my fucking money <laughs> just so I can have access to my friends list. Uh huh. Like that really annoys me. But I mean, this is just where like the world is heading. So like I'm trying to like figure out what I think about like the metaverse and like where things are going because, dude, as I like if I'm looking at the writing on the wall, like our generation, like we're very much. Um, like we're used to like seeing people, you know, uh-huh. like we want to be around people. But like, as I see like with my kids and I think about like future generations, like as generations, as like, as the next generation comes, you're always more accepting of whatever current technology that there is. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it's so you're just easily adaptable. So, I mean, I, f- I look at, I look around and, and Oculus is so like readily available right now and it's so cheap and it's uh-huh. only going to get cheaper and it's just going to get more and more houses. And I'm just like, man, are we fucking moving to a digital world? Like what, cause I was listening to something and somebody was saying that the next wave is, is, is virtual real estate, like mm-hmm. owning real estate, like literal real estate. Like I, not like, you know, like IP addresses and shit like that, but like actual real estate. I'm like, man, what world are we headed to where the next wave is you got to like buy fake real estate, which if there's like a power grid outage, then it's all over. Like Mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter. But like, I think I went down that rabbit hole because like I was trying to understand NFTs. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with NFTs? I am. And it's like, we're just purchasing pieces of, of digital artwork here, people like this is what we're doing. So that way you can go visit probably this artwork in the metaverse at some point. Uh huh. I'm like, man, I got. I should probably get in on this so I can make a whole bunch of money. <laughs> but it's just like, it's blowing my mind as I'm trying to wrap my mind around it all. It really does, and I think that, you know, not to relate it to jujitsu, but just like you know, with jujitsu, you don't you don't focus, uh, or you shouldn't only focus on the technique. You should try to focus on the principle. You try to focus on understanding deeper. And when it comes to like, what I like, I would, I tie those things into like a lot of the the metaverse a lot of crypto a lot of nfts to having a really deep understanding of money Mm -hmm. and because all of these things like uh uh, i was listening to a podcast the other day we're talking about uh uh even bitcoin is you can even consider it like a battery okay Mm -hmm. for for example uh it takes a lot of energy to make bitcoin uh the problem that we have with energy is that our batteries and our transportation of energy is not good enough, right? Mm -hmm. If we had ridiculously good batteries or we had amazing transportation of energy, we would be able to just cover Texas and solar panels and then we would have unlimited renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to get the energy to places. So basically what we have to do is produce energy and then use it almost immediately. Mm. And with Bitcoin, the idea is when people aren't using energy that you are still producing, your solar, your wind, your whatever, you're able to say, okay, we're just going to take all of that energy and put it into Bitcoin, right? Well, Bitcoin is money. We can now use that money later on for whatever we would use money for. It's just a different way of storing energy, right? We're storing it in the form of money. Hmm. And so uh, the idea is like having a deeper understanding of money for me is like going to be, I think the most important thing when it comes to this. And so you just try to look at principles because people talk differently. Like, uh, you know, who Robert Kiyosaki is. Yeah. So the rich dad, poor dad guy. And then like, uh, uh, Dave Ramsey, you know, Dave Ramsey. Mm-hmm. So both guys, they preach completely opposite things. Robert Kiyosaki is use debt, leverage it to buy assets and you will make more money. Right. Dave Ramsey is escape debt. Right. You should not be Zero in debt. debt. So then you say, man, these, you know, they, these guys are totally opposite. They, they disagree on everything. I, I don't know what I should listen to them. What should I learn? Well, they both have a principle that they both really push and it's not buying stupid stuff. Mm. It's not wasting money. Right. Both guys, you know, they have different ideas uh, on how to make money and how to be secure and have financial freedom. Yeah. But they both agree that wasting money on things that are uh, liabilities, 
you shouldn't do. Right. And so you can kind of take that as a principle and you can say, okay, you know, like, and you can, that's why I love the idea of getting as many opinions as you can at first and then starting to go with, because it's also preference too, right? Like it may make sense for me more to follow Dave Ramsey's style of, of doing things than it does Robert Kiyosaki's, right? right? Or the opposite. Yeah. And so I think you just, uh, you try to get as much like, and that's the, 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 I, the thought that I am in with NFTs, crypto, everything else is like, I just want to hear about it. Just yeah. tell me as much about it as possible. I have no opinions. I have no thoughts on it yet because I don't know what's going on, you yeah. know? Uh, uh, but I just want to know more, you know? Same. Yeah, I often don't know what I think about something. And mm-hmm. so I, I, I literally just have to, like, think about it for a long time. I was explaining to Deja one time that if I if I get, like, a thought or there's something in my mind I need to work over, it's it's almost like I have to – like a like a computer, it's like a processor. Like I have to like put it in the back of my mind and let my mind just like subconsciously like process this thing until I figure out what exactly I actually think about it. But I think that's how it is for people. But now you're not allowed to think about stuff. You have to have an opinion on it immediately. Yes, if you don't wait, you don't know how you feel about this political thing that just happened yesterday. That's ridiculous. Like, I don't know yet. Yeah, and like, dude, I don't. You know, I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions, you yeah. know? And I think that it's so tough to, you know, that's that's the age that we live in is you, you know, you choose a side, you represent everything that this side believes now, yeah. and you represent every member of that side. Oh, yes. It's crazy. It is. And it's, it's crazy. It's so, uh, you know, it stifles growth and it it's just impossible to live in. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Dude, how am I supposed to have how am I supposed to have an opinion on NFTs right now? I don't the smartest people in the world don't even know understand them yet. Yeah. And uh, like how am I supposed to? Yeah, I like to ask people because I want to know how like how would you word it? Like as far as like whatever your understanding is because then that maybe adds to my understanding a little bit. So how would I word like an NFT? Well, you don't have to answer, but like that's why I typically ask questions. It's like, man, you, you don't necessarily cuz yeah, to your point, I think um, a lot of us will jump to a conclusion, even if we don't have a, a clear understanding. But for me to help, like me understand an idea, I like to ask different ideas, even though you may not have a, a fully cooked out thought on it. Uh-huh. Sometimes it helps to hear even like your your half, like like this <laughs> like this is what I understand about it. Take it for what you will. It definitely helps to just to get all those inputs because man, it's such an it's such a, an evolving thing that even. Even the people who are really involved, like, do they even really know what's fully going on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, who knows what's going on here, man? And the the problem that happens now is if I really wanted to, I could make my entire Instagram feed people exactly like me. I could yeah. be like, I'm only going to follow half Asian people that do jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, right? you could. And so then what happens is I'm not thinking about people other than these people I'm only hearing their opinions, their their thoughts, and like, yeah, yeah, we all we all agree on this. And then anyone else who doesn't agree on this, they're evil. They're Echo chamber. Yeah, they're not part of this. You know, yeah. they're not part of our group. Dude, do you ever like look on like Twitter or Instagram comments and and just kind of see what people are saying? Oh yeah, dude, it scares the shit out of me. It's crazy because I know what I feel and think about certain things, or what I what I think I think about certain things, and then I'll, I'll be like, all right, well, what are the other people saying? pick an issue it doesn't matter but it's like i'll I'll look especially on twitter i'm like holy shit there are some great like can you like why can you logically really believe the things that you're saying or like have you not read what you just said like how hateful it Mm -hmm. sounds it's just so crazy the like how polarized people can get on some mm-hmm. of these things. It really is like, it's crazy. Like it's such a, it's such an interesting like space. So I wonder how that's going to translate when we go, I'll go 3d into the metaverse. <laughs> Dude. I, I just think, I think people think that they're so much smarter than they actually are. Oh yeah. Uh, that is just in, in, there's also no way to like that, that people even test it anymore. It's just like, yeah, I, I, so I, I saw on Facebook the other day, someone was asking about like, uh, would you, it was something like, would you rather have this amount of money now? Um, or is it was like $5 million now? Mm-hmm. Or then it was like uh, 10 million in five years or 20 million in five years. Mm. And one of the to- one of the comments on it was a guy and he was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I would take the money now because if I, you know, if I had 5 million, I by five with five years, I could turn that into a hundred million. Mm. And like, no, you couldn't. Because if you did, you'd be taking every dollar that you have now and five Xing it. Yeah. You would be rich. Yeah. You know, 
you don't know how to do that. <laughs> it's not that, you know, that the, but you're able to create this thing that you say, well, yeah, if I had money, I would be able to make so much more now. And you're like, but you would have money if, if you, if you were yeah. going to be able to make it, you would have it. Right. Yeah. And in so, theory. And so, yeah, in, in theory. Yeah. Right. And so the, the idea is, uh, you know, but I can just make that claim mm-hmm. and it's just out in the world. Right. And, Who's to say that I'm wrong, right? Who's to say that I can't, I couldn't make that? Well, I don't know. And that's how we do with like every political thing. Well, if this, the other side would have done this, yeah. then we would have been, you know, everything would have been fine. Everybody if, has the answer. If COVID would have been handled this way, we would have been fine. Yeah. You know, like, no, that's not true. You don't know that. No one knows for sure. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's just like we all get to have an opinion online mm-hmm. and then there's just no, you know, there's no test on these things you know it's just hey it's just journalism right you don't get (laughs) you don't get in trouble for posting you know for for writing an article that just is a lot you know yeah and uh it's like that on facebook and stuff now too dude it's wild out there man (laughs) it's wild i've I've definitely have gotten at times just very disenchanted and i was just like let me just step back from this and just like recenter focus on the things that matter you Mm -hmm. know what i'm saying so um do you ever foresee like you teaching jujitsu in the metaverse, bro? You know, I've been yeah, thinking you're, about you're, that a you're, lot. You're gonna be in there in the metaverse teaching away. I was thinking, uh so this is this is what my I don't know about the metaverse teaching <laughs> jujitsu. But if I saw some weird place that jujitsu would go, yeah. It just in thought, there couldn't it be possible to have some type of AI learning of jujitsu that can show you, you know, or, or is that not possible? There, I mean, there is a, there's got to be a finite of amount of things that you can do with your body, right? Yeah. And so uh, maybe, maybe it'll never be possible just because of all the variables of it. But couldn't you see jujitsu one day moving into like I put my height weight into a thing and they say yes these are the lessons that you should know or <laughs> based on you know based on this based on your goals yeah. you should know this by this amount of time you know couldn't you see that yeah be good and, and maybe not because like education is just so hard but yeah. i don't know maybe it could be dude well with with this thing that elon musk is talking about right where he just connects right to your brain so we don't even have to like use words to talk i mean if if there if if the whole human experience is almost like all up here and it's just all about input and then we can directly tap into that, can we create an experience that's like indistinguishable? And if visually, I think it's going to get so good that we can, but then how do you surpass like the actual physical feeling input? Is that something that can also be surpassed by tapping into the brain? So then you feel like you're actually feeling and getting resistance and stuff. I don't know. I don't either. I don't know. That'd be so <laughs> crazy, though, dude. Oh my goodness. Or maybe you have like a dummy, and it can tap in to like somebody else, and then as they move, the, the dummy moves. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it could be like. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Real Steel? Yes. Where they have like With the Hugh Jackman. Yeah, where, and they have the the robots, and eventually they're like, yeah, these sparring robots got so good, so we just had them fight each other. Yeah. And uh, like, yeah, that's what that's where jujitsu will go. You'll have everyone will have their own robot to train with. You yes, know? it's just all <laughs> robots, and you don't actually be there. <laughs> We're moving to the future, Josh. That's the move. Holy cow, dude! What do you do outside of jujitsu? Is it is it just your whole life? No, not at all. Um, my wife and I hike a lot. Uh, I cook a lot. That's probably my biggest hobby outside of jujitsu. Okay. Uh, it's you know it's it's something about the going hand in hand with being able to be creative. Like there are certain rules that you follow and certain ideas that you follow, yeah. but you get to be really creative. Yeah. And so uh, that's when I have a hobby. That's usually what I'm looking for is something that I get to be creative with. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, that's what that's one of my main things that I do. Um, I love cooking. I do too. It's a I, good time. It is. Oh my goodness. It um it's hard, not necessarily hard, but it uh it's it's easy for me to find myself uh kind of just going into autopilot and cooking the same things sometimes. Uh, of course. It's like, man, you gotta really test your brain to get creative and that that is fun to do. It really is. And and yeah, just any chance and like creativity is like a muscle, you know. Oh, you, yeah. The more you do it, the more you look at every situation. You go, well, how could I be creative with this? You know, yeah. how could I do something different or do something fun? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and then also, I, I think about cooking too. Is if you think about it, uh, it is 
the only art that you really are supposed to use all of your senses for, mm. right? Uh, if you think about it, like when I look at a picture or something like that, mm. uh, you know, like in jujitsu, I don't want to smell jujitsu. No. You know, I don't want to taste jujitsu. Better if you don't. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Ideally, I'm not doing either of those yeah. things, right? But with cooking, you smell, you taste, you see, you feel, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? You can hear things on the hear pan the as, they're, yeah, as yeah. they're cooking. And so, like, with cooking, I think that's, like, the only art that you get to experience with all five senses. Yeah. And so, that I, for me, that is what, you know, that's what I love about it is that I can be chopping something and be like, oh, I, I think that 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 steak needs to be flipped. I can hear it, you know? You yeah. Can, you know, I can smell it. I can, you know, and so, like, being able to do that. Uh, it's just such a fun thing to engage your senses senses in. Oh yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I'm going to uh, I'm going to smoke a turkey for Thanksgiving. First of all, I've never smoked anything, so I'm probably going to ruin this turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to take like ten or twelve hours. But uh, yeah, man, just just the challenge of just trying trying new things. Do you have a smoker? Yeah, so I have a uh, I have a grill with like an offset smoker on it, so I don't have like an actual like smoker uh -huh. box. We're gonna see. I don't know, man. But... If you keep your temperature consistent. Smoking stuff is the e is super easy. You do a lot of smoking. I I don't do a crazy amount, but I do uh, enough that I like feel confident in it. Mm. And uh, yeah, if you just like as long as the temperature stays consistent, it's an oven. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and so it's just an oven that adds much more flavor. Right. Smoked turkey is the best. Dude, too. I'm so excited to try it, man. It's such a good choice. That's such a good idea. Yeah, should be fun, man. Um, have you ever thought about going into like competitive barbecue or anything? I've never thought about it. I just like. I don't know. I, I just enjoy doing it to do it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I enjoy doing it to feed myself, my wife. You yeah. know, like I, you know, that's kind of why I enjoy doing it. You know, I've thought about like, you know, because sometimes if, if you feel like you're a good cook, you'll go places and you'll be like, well, I can cook much better than this. Oh, yeah. You know, this place sucks. But I wouldn't want to do it for a living. I wouldn't want to do no, it for a living, no right? Way. And I already take jujitsu which is my other main hobby uh -huh. and it's yo know, and it's very business focused a lot of the way i look at stuff and so with cooking i'm like man i want to keep it completely a i bet i would do less jujitsu yeah or, or sorry i would do less cooking if i wasn't so focused on business and jujitsu i would probably just be all about jujitsu mm -hmm. but like since it's my job i like to be able to separate myself from it and say okay i'm just going to do this yeah and so i want to do everything i can to keep it from being a job you know like oh yeah my wife gets frustrated i don't ever write down recipes like she's like oh you made this this is so good we got to write it down i'm like ah you know, that's too much work oh yeah it's just all feel yeah it's just it's it, all feel it is just all feel yeah man yeah there's a big difference between i always say like if you're like a chef or a baker like there's a type of personality right like you, a baker whether you're baking or not like they always want like a recipe mm -hmm. they want measurements and they want the steps to follow but a chef is just like oh a little bit of this a little bit of that oh that smells good and i think that's good have, have you ever watched the chef show on netflix uh it's called chef it's called the chef show no it's um uh do you know john favreau is Yes. So yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I've watched that because his movie. I love. Dude, I love that movie. The movie show. Yeah, yeah right? and I have seen that show. Uh huh. So man, that show is one of my favorites because Roy Choi is the the mm -hmm. head cook on it, and you know he owns all these restaurants and stuff, and he's this amazing cook. Mm -hmm. And sometimes John will say, "Okay, well, you know, like this is the recipe we're cooking from," and he'll start doing it, and Roy will be like, "Why are you doing it like that?" And John will go. That's the recipe you sent me. Right. He's like, that's your recipe. And he's like, oh, I don't do it like that anymore. That's just, that doesn't even make sense <laughs> that's anymore. That's outdated, uh, buddy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just like – and you see that with jujitsu. Like if I had a student I trained three or four years ago and they came in trying to do something, right. I'd be like, hey – that's horrible. Why are you doing that? You're like, you showed me. I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry. Dude, my bad. I, <laughs> I sucked really bad then. You shouldn't have listened. And that's – yeah, that's – I think that's the fun thing uh, you know, about it is is that it's just so creative and you just get the – you know, there aren't really many oh, yeah. rules. You just do what you want with it. Yeah, man. Not enough people cook these days, man. It uh, it, it definitely is like a good way to kind of – I, I – I, I spend a lot of, like, whenever I'm cooking, I spend a lot of time, like, thinking. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, I'm focused on the thing, but just things will come from the ether, you know what I mean? Like, maybe you're, like, you have a problem on your mind or something, like, boom, like, an idea will come. It's just, like, that downtime mm -hmm. to where you're not overly stimulated, like, taking stuff in. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, you, you almost always, you're, you're in the car, you're listening to a podcast, yeah. you're, in the, you're always trying to absorb something, but, yeah. like, sometimes it's nice. That's, you get that feeling from jujitsu too, sometimes. Obviously someone's trying to kill you the whole time. Right. Uh, so it's different. 
but you still get that escape where it's like my mind can't be focused on a lot of other things. So it's just allowed to like kind of slowly drift to, yeah. you know, like you'll be training with somebody and be like, man. I haven't listened to that song in a long time. That's a good song. <laughs> like, and so it's just like you're you're you don't give yourself a lot of times enough time to to think. You yeah, know? yeah. Do that downtime to be bored is like it's good. It really you know is. What I mean, where you're not like so focused and tuned in, you just kind of see what comes. And it's pretty hard to be bored anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just like uh, there's just so there's always something you could do. Dude, I'll habitually just pick up my phone. Mm-hmm. And sometimes my phone will be dead and I forget it's dead and I'll oh, I'll pick it up and I'm like, oh it's dead. And I'm like and I'll put it back down. And I'm like, why the hell? Like I know it's dead. Why did I just pick that up? Like I'm trying to like, I'm looking for that dopamine hit, dude. Uh-huh. It's like, man, let me just take a break from this thing. <laughs> just take a break. It's tough though, man. It really is. It really is. I was just oh. going to ask you, are you, uh, what other hobbies do you have? Man, my whole life right now is just podcasting and jujitsu and really, I spend an exorbitant, like exorbitant, 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 I can't even say the word. I know what you're trying to you, say. You know what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to try to verbalize it. Yeah, but. I can't even say the word. I spend a lot of time. <laughs> Honestly, dude, I just I think a lot about business all the time. I'm just trying to think about how can I solve this economic piece of the puzzle. You know what I'm saying? Like, because mm-hmm. dude, money will make me really happy. Uh-huh. To be honest with you, like obviously I get like the whole in- incremental thing, but it's like, man, there's just there's just a certain level of just ease and just like even confidence that comes with just like knowing like, all right, I got that piece mm-hmm. solved. I completely yeah. If you had, you know, like. Uh, uh, your podcast if it's like making like X amount of dollars a month there is a certain point that you would go man I don't you know I'm no longer worried about money yeah. I will still use it and I'll still try to grow it and I'll still try to yeah but there's a certain point where you can go like wow right there I just don't have to to worry you yeah. know I, I, and that's like that's always the goal right <laughs> is, dude, to, is dude. to get there I've heard Rogan talk about how in like the early days of his career whenever he was still doing like TV and stuff how he got like a really big I don't know, like $150,000 check or something for a TV show. And he was just like, oh, it's like, all right, I don't got to worry about money anymore. But now I got to work really hard to not be broke anymore. <laughs> Which is, but it's like, man, like, all right, now that's solved. Now let's just, I think, I think there's a certain level of, of mental space that gets freed up that allows you to be that much more creative whenever you're not so focused on that one piece. Let me ask you this. If you, were to whatever your money is that you have, but you kind of looking for it, like let's say it's a certain amount per month. Let's say you solve that. What would you do after that? Dude, I, I do the same shit I'm doing. That's, <laughs> see, that's the thing. Uh-huh. Like, I feel very fortunate in that, like I'm doing pretty much everything I want to be doing, which is really cool. It's like, I just, but I just want to like, now I want to like 10 exit, right? Mm-hmm. Like I want to like reach more people. I like want to, I want to grow it. Like I want to build like a team. Like I just want it to, grow and like reach more people but it's definitely still just doing the same shit Uh but i would like to be able to for example like be able to if i want to talk to somebody like fly them in and and like put them up in a nice hotel and like oh dude let's go grab dinner and like that's all on me like i would just love to be able to create like an awesome experience for anybody that i interact with Uh all the time and you gotta have money to do that shit you really do you really do i think it's so yeah it's just so important to to kind of have that thought of like, okay, I think a lot of times it's you, you, you just focus on making money or some people just focus on making money and then it's like, okay, well, you know, now I'm here, but I hate my life, you know, and I have to keep doing what I'm doing to right. make money, right? Yeah. And so then you get to this point where you go, well, now I have to take all these steps back. I have to lose the amount of money that I'm making, you know, and it's like, yeah. it becomes this trap. But if you set yourself up and go, hey, whatever I'm doing, I really like to do it. Yeah. And then I focus on making money through that. I'm going to still enjoy doing it. It's still going to be good. Right. Yeah. Cause I'm not making any money doing the, most of the things that I do really mm-hmm. like, not like in a grand scale. I'm like, but I would still love doing all of those things. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just, now I just need to figure out how can I make those things make me money? You know what I'm saying? So I often have a hard time talking to people because like when we're doing, like, I'm having conversations on the podcast. Like, yeah, I love going in deep, but like, just like out in the world, like if you just catch me, most of the time I'm thinking about money, and it's it's I I think about it all the fucking time. It's like a constant, like all right, what can I be doing? What do I need to be doing? 
like all right like it's always on my mind and then when you just talk to a normal person like i don't think they think that way so it's like ah i don't really have much to say because all i'm thinking about is money right now and how can i make it <laughs> yeah and it's like you know some people they 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 like to live their life without thinking about money yeah. you know like uh you know hey i'm going to work this many hours a week my stuff is going to be paid for i'll get 6 weeks 4 weeks 3 weeks whatever a vacation yeah that's my life i'm okay with that yeah um and then there are some people that are not and they're like i i can't live this way i have to i have to make more doing you know working less so i can enjoy my life more yeah and it's really hard when you're on one side or the other to understand where the other is coming from cuz like it, you know if for you or i if we talk to somebody who's like Yes, I am really happy to work until I am, you know, 65 or now 70, however old you have to work till you're, you know, you retire. Like, yeah, I'm happy working the same job. I don't have to think about it very much. I don't have to make big decisions. And for someone like you or I, like, that's crazy. You don't want to be making huge decisions that are make or break for your life all the time. All the time. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, bro? I want complete control. And yeah, and it's like, so it's just two different styles of thinking, I guess. And yeah. You know, it's really, really hard because that's um, it's like my best friend. That's uh, we have talked business since we were in high school, since yeah. we were probably before high school. That has been pretty much the one of the main thoughts that we've always talked about. One of my about. favorite like, conversations. Yeah, having it like, oh yeah, we got it all figured out. We're like sixteen in <laughs> high school. Like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna, you know, we're and honestly, we actually did do a lot of the things that we claimed. We were wrong about it at sixteen, how we were gonna do it, mm -hmm. but the desire was there, right? Yeah, you had the idea. And so, uh, you know, it, I think that it's so hard though when we talk about like, you know, he'll hire somebody in one of his businesses. And then they'll be set up to make money doing like, um, like not, it's not sales, but they're just like the more the business grows, the more they make. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Hey, this dude just doesn't, he's cool with just making this amount and he's just not working any harder. It's weird. Yeah. And he's like, why, why would he do that? I'm like, I think he's just probably cool with making that amount. And he's like, I don't understand. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> uh, it, it, but he's not, uh, so, wait, what do you mean? He's cool with it. You know, and so like we have that conversation, like yeah, yeah. just a different mindset. Dude, often people aren't money motivated, or mm -hmm. they, they are up to a certain point, right? And then whenever you start moving into like leadership positions, like how do I get these fucking people motivated? Oftentimes, I feel like it's just recognition, just making people feel good, having purpose. Yeah, and it's like, you know, you say it's it's money, but it's not just money. It can't just be. If it was just money, you wouldn't go. Okay, podcast is how I'm going to make money. No, yeah, right? it's not. It's not just money. I want. I just. I just think about it because it's the thing I don't have. It's the. And it's, I just. I want to make enough money so I don't think about it anymore. Uh huh. That's really it. Like I don't want to think about it anymore. I just want to just do cool shit with cool people. You know, I think there will be a time where we're doing a podcast on your show or my show, and we're both talking about. Hey, remember that conversation that we had? Without a doubt. Yeah, that we would. You know. That we we said we weren't going to be worried about money. We'll be worried about something else. Yeah, but, yeah, know. dude. <laughs> just got to keep going down the path, dude. I think that's just a lot of success, whether it's business or jujitsu. Or I've noticed that a lot with uh, just with the fighting game with MMA. I've just I've seen people make it to the UFC just because, not because you know they're, they're not bad fighters, but they're not like exceptional fighters either. They're just they're fucking journeymen and they stuck around long enough, and you just outlasted people. And it's like, man, if you just stick around long enough, good things will happen. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, and that's like, yeah, and it's so hard not to get discouraged though. Yeah, it's frustrating when you are like, I, I look at my gym especially because my gym is like the one thing that I have in business that I can kind of look at and say, Hey, this is at least starting to be successful. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, or this is successful or whatever, you know, however you measure it. But when I look at that, when I started early, it was like, man, I went years before I ever made a dollar from the gym. I was making enough to pay rent. And then I was working full time doing personal training. Yeah, You do personal training for a very long and, time. Yeah. And it was like, man, you know, like, so then when I go to my podcast and I start to get discouraged and I'm like, man, I'm, in, I'm never going to, I'm never going to get enough listeners. I'm never going to get big enough sponsors. You know, and you get that same fight of like just that negativity. You go, oh, wait, you know, I did have success one time. You know, I had success with this gym, right? Yeah. I think I can do it again. And it's the same with like jujitsu, right? You, you know, you get arm barred by the same guy a million times, then you escape once. And then a lot of times that dude never arm bars you again. It's yeah. like, whoa. 
I actually figured out how to, you know, I figured it out. I figured now I can apply this. Now I can, right. now I can use it. But if you give up after the hundredth arm bar and maybe you were going to escape one Oh one and it's like, you never get to know. But if you, so if you have that desire and that drive to like, I'm going to make money, you just keep doing it until you die or you make money. <laughs> yeah. One of the two. Yeah. Or maybe you just pivot and, and figure it out. But yeah, man, like persistence goes such a long way, dude, such a long way. And, 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 and going through like even though you don't feel like it just just doing it i definitely slowed down some with the podcast there for a second i mean you can always use 2020 as an excuse but shit that's almost two years ago now so it's like man like you got to just quit like you can't make excuses you just have to do the work you know what i'm saying how, how long how long have you had your podcast um three and a half years now man three and a half years so i'm always real hard on myself because I um I started off just so gun ho I was doing two episodes a week I was really killing it and then like it was this complete momentum cut off and then I started to like get some momentum again and then like it's just kind of back and forth and then so I'll tell myself the story of where like one episode a week isn't good enough you should really be doing two and then you tell us that story and then and then I'll go two months without an episode so now it's just like all right man cut the shit cut the excuses like let's just get it going so now i'm dedicated to the one a week i'm really sh I'm, I'm working towards the two a week but like i'm not going to talk myself out of getting stuff done like for example this week i think i'm doing six podcasts this week Oof. yeah so i'll have enough episodes for the next like month and a half so with that being said it's like all right well at least i have a month and a half in the bank and then as i'm i'm building more episodes now i can start shifting to the two a week because i'll have enough right so it's like all right maybe i was going to you know, release this one next Tuesday, but I'll release it this Thursday instead. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where, where I'm going with it, man. man. And that's like, that's just a constant battle. Yeah, with... man. There's an internal battle. I, I always appreciate when people, like, we don't ever want to like live in that negative place. Like you can't live there, mm -hmm. but you, it, it helps to acknowledge it. It's a real thing. We all, we all have these internal battles and these struggles. And so many people, to, to the point of like everybody's putting their highlight reel up, you act like you, it's, it's weak or you can't, you can't say a negative thought or you can't express when you're feeling down or you can't express your struggles. But it's like, man, if you're feeling it, more likely somebody else is feeling it. And it helps, one, it helps just to talk it out sometimes with somebody else just for yourself. But also when you put it out there and somebody else is going through it and then they hear it, they're like, oh, shit, man, like I'm not alone. And it, it helps people to talk through the struggles sometimes. I feel like we're always so focused on just being like positive all the time. Uh -huh. The negative is there too. Like we, it, It's a spectrum. And it's something that we all deal with, right? Yeah. And it's like that you know, positivity is easy to accept, you know? It's oh, like yeah. it's a lot easier to accept. But like negativity, we've got to – We've got to battle it. Yeah, you know? it's valid too. It is. Dude, it, it is. is. Uh, there are some times where I have like these thoughts with my business and they like they, they come from a very negative place, but I find a solution because right. of it because I came from that really negative place. It's the, uh, it's the negative thoughts that don't have any uh, – they don't have any like – bearing right like when you go in and you say like okay you know you can't do this you're a failure right and it's like well maybe you could maybe you can't you know we'll mm -hmm. see but i'm not gonna know unless i actually do it right right but, like a lot of times we are so negative and just continuing and just grinding right well if you don't you know if you quit your podcast now really you didn't fail because you chose to quit but if you try for five more years and then you quit now you're a failure right yeah and it's like no it just I'm going to keep trying this, you know, Let's keep going. And eventually I will either succeed and figure something else out yeah. or I'm going to die. Those are the only choices. Yeah, dude. And it's like, it's, it's like, what's your measure of success is your measure of success. Did you build something as big as Joe Rogan or did you just build something that's like super cool? And it, maybe you just, maybe you just need to kind of think about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And you probably have a lot of people who you affect on your podcast before you ever made a dollar, right? Yeah. When you make money, then you can hire somebody to do all your scheduling and to <laughs> do all your other stuff, and then you get to affect more people. Yeah. But it's like when we're all starting out on whatever we're doing, we're just we're starting from the bare, mm -hmm. you know, like the the bare minimum, just trying to s develop skills. Like, you know, I I'm sure you feel like you're a better podcaster now than you were 200 episodes ago. Oh yeah. You know, and it's like for me too. Like when I was starting my podcast, I was like, man, I hope. By episode 50, it's big. Or I hope by episode this, it's big. And then I just started to realize, like, oh, no, it'll get big when it gets big. Mm -hmm. I need to just be focused on 
becoming better at it. Yeah, just get good. Yeah, and being you know being better at talking and being better at scheduling and being better at you. I mean, like the things that I'm weak at too. Yeah, and so uh, I think that that's so important for us to just go in and say we're gonna keep grinding. Yeah, just keep going forward, man. It's don't succumb to the negativity. Like it's there. It's okay. Just don't succumb to it and just realize that not every thought that you tell yourself is true. <laughs> that is very true. Dude. That is, uh, that's something that, that I, I remember hearing that on a podcast like a year ago going, Whoa, you know, I don't, I never, th- I mean, I know that, yeah, but I never think about that. I never think a lot of times it's easy to think like what I believe on something that has to be the truth. Mm-hmm. Cause if it wasn't, I wouldn't believe it. Right. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't think about it like right. that way. But, Maybe I'm stupid, you know. Like maybe I don't know, or maybe you just got like a, some bad information at a certain point, and then you developed your your thought off of that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, with with you know, like when I had my I, the first hundred episodes of my podcast, I asked the same question at the end. It was, "How do you suck less at jujitsu?" And almost everybody said, "You just got to stay in it. Yeah, you just got to keep doing it. Just keep showing up. You know." And it's like it's like that with everything. You mm-hmm. just have to. To be a master at anything, you just have to do it for a long time. Yeah. And especially, like, you got to push yourself through on those days that it's really hard to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can, can if you can get through those days and you can continue to do it when things are great and your podcast is huge and you're making a ton of money, yeah. you're going to be like, yeah, I can keep doing this. Yeah. I, I did it when I was making zero dollars and I was super tired from the job that I was working, you know. I can do it easily now. Yeah, yeah. Those are the test days, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that's where discipline comes in or, or whatever habits that you have. It's like, man, how do you push through those days? I always just try to appreciate this time because you always hear very successful people always talk about like, oh, man, those times that I thought, you know, were that, that were the toughest or I wasn't going to miss or they sucked really bad, like while we're building this thing, it's like they always love those times the most. So I'm like, well, all right, man, well, I'm really loving this time. It's, it's <laughs> awesome, but how, <laughs> how can <laughs> How can we get through this? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you'll just go in and start telling people after, you know, when you start to get more successful, yeah. you'll be like, yeah, yeah, I, I loved it. It was awesome. I, yeah, it was great. It was, it was great. Yeah, dude. it's easy. To, dude, I'll even look back, though, now just over the podcast, like, man, dude, that was X amount of years ago, like two years ago I had that conversation. Like, man, that was really cool. And, like, to see where you are now, it's like, man, I was just – on my couch in my living room, like I'm still in my house, but like I definitely have like a much better setup now. So uh-huh. it's like, man, the progression's there, man. I saw an old video of uh, of Rogan. I think he was like at year three, like still in his house, like on his couch, and it looked like I'm like that looks like my fucking setup. <laughs> so I'm like, man, just relax, just relax. Uh huh. We'll all get there. We will. We will. That's good. <laughs> That's good advice. Dude, I don't know. Just take time. All right, Josh, we're at, yeah, dude, we're at an hour and a half. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, buddy, tell me or tell the folks how they can check you out. Uh, where, where should they go? The best place to go if you are jujitsu, like that's why you're following me, which I assume there's no other reason to be following me. <laughs> why would you? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're just a handsome guy. Uh, that's what I'm saying. There's Beautiful a lot of hair, those. There's a lot smile. of them. They're everywhere. <laughs> uh, they're a dime a dozen, right? <laughs> and so I would say that uh, one of like the most – important things you could do is I wrote a book called Simplifying Jiu-Jitsu. It's a free ebook and you can get it at simplifyingjujitsu.com. And if you go and download that book, it'll put you on my email list. And that is where I share like, uh, whatever podcasts I have coming out, whatever, um, products we have coming out, different thoughts, random stuff. Uh, but I think that that is always like the best place to go. You can also follow me on Instagram at the Josh McKinney. Uh, but, Honestly, I'm pretty inconsistent with posting on social media. Uh, the the big thing I think would be to be on my email list. You, yeah. you just get. I, I think that has the most benefit. If somebody listened to this whole episode. I feel like uh, they, a lot of it had to do with that they like jujitsu, right? And so, because we talked a ton of jujitsu, tons on this. of jujitsu. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, if that is somebody, I think that it will greatly affect your jujitsu if you go to simplifyingjujitsu.com and download the free ebook. Perfect. Simplifyingjujitsu.com. I suck at jujitsu podcast. Mm-hmm. Go check it out for sure. All right, Josh. Thanks again, buddy. Thank you for having me. All right, bye everybody.